Giants will join us. If not, they can watch. Yeah, I'm sure that there will be some others coming around. Uh, Patrick, you want to put up uh, the first image or some image uh, of John the Baptist, just so we have somebody to focus on? Um, but yeah, um, essentially today, one. our focus is going to be on John. Okay, thank you. This is a uh, contemporary uh, Ukrainian icon uh, done by uh, a fairly young uh, icon painter uh, named Luba Yatskiv. And uh, there are three panels here that kind of also tell the story of his life. In the middle is John, and you'll see on a plate he has his head, uh, which is a reminder that for all of his uh, courageous preaching and work, uh, he paid for it with his life. Uh, at the end, in opposing King Herod, uh, Salome did a dance, asked then her stepfather uh, for uh, some kind of reward, and uh, he said he would give her half the kingdom. So I guess it must have been quite a dance. <laughs> but uh, she asked for the head of John the Baptist, uh, and this was at the prompting of her mother, who wanted this troublesome preacher removed. Uh, on the left is John preaching. We will have a couple of other images of John preaching. Uh, I, I particularly like the way that this iconographer portrays him as a very wild looking desert man um, with his hands raised there preaching. And the Jordan River, I think, symbolized between himself and the people listening to him, the wings on John in the middle portion of this are something that happens when uh, you have someone who is so unusual that they're just as much part of heaven as they are part of earth. One of the ways in time that they try to symbolize this, it's a metaphor really, is by sticking wings on him. He obviously did not have wings. Um, in fact, the way that he's even described in the gospels is a, almost perfect re, uh, uh, reappearance of the prophet Elijah. And you may recall that at least in one of the uh, conversations that take place about John, in fact, a couple of them, uh, the question is asked whether or not he is Elijah who has returned. Because if you remember, Elijah did not die, but Elijah was taken up in a fiery chariot by God to be with him uh, in heaven. Uh, so maybe God was sending Elijah back at a critical time uh, to prepare the way of the Messiah. But it's interesting, the answer always given was no. Uh, he may be in the spirit of Elijah, but this is not Elijah. This is John. He is the son of the, the priest Zechariah and his wife Elizabeth. And in fact, uh, therefore, since we know something about who Elizabeth and Zechariah were, we know that he is related to Jesus. He's a cousin of Jesus because Mary is a cousin of Elizabeth. And then over on the right is the event that we uh, commemorate, celebrate uh, in the Epiphany season, the baptism of his cousin, Jesus, in the Jordan River. And in the accounts of that, there are very interesting exchanges between the two. Um, by the way, it's most common to call John, John the Baptist. But uh, you may, may see in, in better translations of the scriptures today that the more accurate translation of the word is baptizer uh, rather than Baptist. I know I have had at least one person say to me, was he the one who founded the Baptist church? And I had to say uh, by way of answer, uh, no, not, not really. Uh, the one thing that he and the Baptist church or Baptists have in common is uh, baptism. Uh, which essentially means washing. And it, of course, it was a washing uh, of a symbolic kind. It wasn't just a bath. It was a washing uh, for, for change and for sorrow for one's sins. And as a commitment of um, continuing in a very different way going forward. John, John's birth was miraculous. It puts him into the category of a number of other figures in the uh, scriptures, probably the first one we come in contact with is 
Isaac, who is the son of Abraham and Sarah. Abraham and Sarah are too elderly to have children, but the three heavenly visitors who come to them uh, and are taken care of, given great hospitality underneath the oak tree at Mamre, they say that when they pass by next year, uh, there will be a child, and that child will be named, given a name by them, God laughs, which is Yitzhak or, or, or Isaac. There are others too. Um, a particularly memorable one is the uh, woman Hannah, who is married to a man named Elkanah, and they're incapable of having a child. It's not that they're too old, they're just impossibly, uh, it, having a child is impossible, or at least it had been for all of their marriage. Hannah then prays at the at the house of God where the ark is kept in Shiloh. This is before the temple in Jerusalem. And lo and behold, uh, in a year's time, she has a child who she then brings as soon as he's uh, old enough to the service of God's house. And this will become, this child will become a great prophet, Samuel. Uh, there also is Samson, uh, the great sort of, defender of the faith, the judge of Israel, the one who knocks down the building and kills all the Philistines, the one who falls in love with Delilah and who cuts his hair off. Um, he is also a miracle baby. And so John the Baptist and, uh, is part of a group of, of unusual people. You might say Jesus is included in this too, whose birth is, is something that's a, a sheer impossibility become possible because of God's gift and plan. And so John was always intended to be uh, a prophet. Prophet here again, just to remind ourselves, is not somebody who tells the future so much as someone who has uh, the ability to say to the people, this is what God wants you to hear right here, right now, uh, given the situation. A lot of people consider John the Baptist to be the last of the prophets or the messengers of God from the Old Covenant. Uh, Jesus, in a certain way, as a prophet too, uh, being the first one in the New Covenant and being something much, much more than a prophet. How about another image, uh, Patrick? This is uh, by another contemporary uh, iconographer named uh Demidko, I believe, and uh, this is the baptism in the Jordan again. You see John on the left. Uh, the scroll in his hand is a symbol of the fact that he's a preacher. We don't have any writings of his, but we do have his words in several of the Gospels. Jesus is in the middle. Now, obviously, this is a stylized version of it. The river is behind him. Angels uh, sort of waiting to help him dry off are, are on the right, signifying that this is an event in which heaven and earth are intersecting with one another, coming into very close contact with one another. And above the head of Christ is a mandorla. That's always a sign or a symbol of the kingdom of heaven. And light is coming down on three rays of it probably signifying the Trinity, onto Jesus. And there is a dove there, because in the record of Jesus' baptism in the Gospels, uh, the voice of the Father is heard when Jesus comes out of the water, saying, this is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. Uh, Jesus uh, is, is therefore acknowledged to be not just the teacher, but in fact, the, the, the chosen one, the Messiah, the anointed one, the Christ. Uh, this feast of Epiphany or Theophany, the very words uh, suggest that this is a revelation or a showing, not only of the fact that Jesus is both human and divine, but maybe more importantly, maybe more broadly, that in the coming of Jesus, uh, the plan of God to bring humankind and to bring the world in closer connection with God uh, is going to be fulfilled. And this is but seen by all of the writers in the history of the church, 
as kind of the beginning of Jesus' ministry, almost um, his anointing, his baptism, his ordination, uh, his installation as uh, God's uh, ultimate prophet and messenger. How about another one there, Patrick? This is uh, an icon of the feast of uh, the birth of John the Baptist, which, by the way, everybody West and East celebrate. It comes on June the 24th. Um, it is a particularly big feast, uh, or it used to be, in Scandinavia. They called it Sanctans Aftan, meaning the vigil of the night before the Feast of St. Saint, Saint John. In Canada today, uh, at least in Quebec province and several others, it is a, a, a holiday because it was uh, the beginning of summer. It comes very close to that equinox that is the beginning of summer, just a couple of days away from that. John is one of the few people uh, who, whose uh, birth from parents, from his uh, human parents, and whose second birthday, his heavenly birthday, the day of his death, are both feast days. Uh, at the very end of the summer on August the 29th, uh, it, that is the day of the beheading of John the Baptist. Uh, it is, uh, in the Eastern Church, the last of the feast days before the new church year begins, because in the Eastern Church, the new, year, the new church year starts September the 1st. Why? Uh, that was when the new civil year began in the Byzantine Empire, and they just simply held on to that day. Uh, they, the Eastern Church does celebrate Advent, but it doesn't take it to be the beginning of the church year like the Western church does. Um, just a couple of words about this. Uh, oh, could you go back to the birth icon for a second? Thank you. Yep. Um, in, in the tradition of iconography, um, icons of the birth of Jesus, the birth of the, the Virgin Mary, or in this case, the birth of John, the baptizer, um, have a, a certain kind of uh, set of players and conventions uh, that are supposed to tell you things. One of them is down there in the left-hand corner where the infant John is by two midwives uh, being ready for a little bath after birth. Uh, and then to the right, you have somebody sitting there. That is the priest Zechariah. And what he's writing on the scroll is when they asked him because he had been struck dumb uh, at a visit from the angel to announce that he's going to have a, a son finally, even though he's too old to have children and his wife is too old. Uh, since he was not yet able to speak, when they asked him at the birth of the, the baby, what should this uh, boy's name be? He writes out, his name shall be John. And that's what he's writing there. And his name, Zechariah, in Slavonic is just to the right, too. And then up at the top, we have three more of the midwives. And one of them is carrying a, a star. You, Some of you may know that in Alaska, for example, as well as Ukraine and other places in Eastern Europe, when they go around singing Christmas carols in the villages, uh, they carry a star, which is a, a reminder of the star that came and remained over the place where Jesus was born. This star here is linked to that because the one who is down there getting his first bath is going to be not just the cousin of the Savior, of the Messiah, but he's going to be the one who really prepares his way. And in fact, as we just saw a minute ago, he is part of the ritual, you might even say, that inaugurates Jesus' ministry, the baptism in the Jordan. Uh, the mother of uh, John is uh, the lady in red, that is Elizabeth, and they, they have halos because in all of the churches, Elizabeth and Zechariah, just like the parents of Mary, uh, Joachim and Anna, are considered holy people. These are people who were very faithful uh, to, to, to God, and uh, who were rewarded for their faithfulness by being given special roles in God's plan. By the way, Mary is another example of somebody whose birth is uh, not only improbable, but impossible. Both of her parents were way past the years of childbearing, but 
uh, an angel, probably the angel Gabriel, came to her father and said, you're going to have a, a child, and that child will be very much involved with the coming of the expected one, the Messiah. Uh, this is, by the way, not in the scriptures, but it's in one of the early church documents called the, the, the first, gospel, uh, first Gospel of James. That's where we get a lot of details about the life of Mary and of Joseph and of Mary's parents, Joachim and Anna. How about the next one? I think uh, the next one is a contemporary Romanian icon of the baptism of Jesus in the Jordan River. Um, it's, it's kind of stripped down to the bare essentials. What I love about this one is that we're sort of smack in the middle of, of the river and there's fish all over the place. <laughs> and the tree of life is blooming again over on the left. Uh, this is because uh, God has now brought the world and heaven so close to one another. You see the dove over Jesus' head in the mandorla. You see the angels waiting to, to help Jesus dry off after his baptism. You see John there depicted, as uh, the Gospels tell us, in uh, the, the skins of animals. He lived in the desert with a leather belt around his waist. He ate locusts and wild honey. In that respect, uh, not only John's dress, but even the way of his life uh, was a virtual uh, echo of, uh, of the prophet Elijah. Because when we meet the prophet Elijah, we know nothing about his parents. We know nothing about his childhood. Uh, he simply appears, he does, uh, in the desert and then gets himself in trouble almost thematically, automatically with uh, King uh, Ahab and Ahab's wife, Queen Jezebel. Uh, prophets tend to have problems with kings, and kings tend to have problems with prophets. In fact, Elijah and John are no exception. Uh, lots of other prophets, Jeremiah, Isaiah, as we learned last week, all have trouble with kings. The reason being, they bring God's word or God's message, which sometimes the king takes as a threat a threat to power, a threat to control. How about the next one, Patrick? This is uh, an icon with uh, what's called the Riza, or a kind of a, a, a cladding of uh, precious metal around it. But uh, you can still see most of the scene here. This is of the beheading of John the Baptist. Uh, already in the dish, by the way, below is his head. Uh, over on the right is when he's being brought into prison. Uh, over on the left, you see the executioner about ready to behead him. And uh, up at the top, you see, interestingly enough, an angel, and then in a small mandorla, Christ, uh, his cousin, Jesus, his cousin, who is blessing him and, and recognizing that this is an act of witness, uh, of faithfulness. Um, a martyr, the very word martyr is the Greek word for witness. And so John, the baptizer, is the very first martyr uh, in the time of Christ's coming. There will be others. The, the one that will, will come right after, um, the res after the resurrection, celebrated the day after Christmas, is the deacon Stephen. You can check your church calendars for that. He's the first feast after it. After Christmas is uh, Stephen, who is the very first martyr after Jesus has come, after the Holy Spirit has come down too. How about the next one, Patrick? <clears throat> this is a detail of uh, a gorgeous mosaic. I myself have seen this up in the gallery of Hagia Sophia in Istanbul. Uh, that particular icon, interestingly enough, has in the middle Jesus, and you probably have seen that face of Jesus. It's very, very frequently found around. Um, to his left is his mother, and then to his right is his cousin, John the Baptist. Um, again, I show this because it's one of the most beautiful depictions of John over the centuries. There are many, many, many others. I mean, I could spend the whole afternoon with you looking at images of John because he's such a popular holy figure in the whole history of Christianity. 
But this one is particularly uh, beautiful because it shows, again, something of the wildness of his personality. And from the little that we have, uh, he, he only uh, appears in the Gospels, in the very first chapters of the Gospels. Uh, and we have some words of his. I mean, we have him, for example, telling the soldiers, stop, stop harassing people, stop extracting bribes. Uh, stop mistreating uh, your office. Be true to your, you know, uh, oath to the emperor. Uh, work just work for justice. Work for keeping the peace. Uh, don't do violence to people for no reason. He also says to the people, uh, God is waiting for you to turn yourselves around. The message of John in Mark's gospel we heard just recently. Uh, is very simple. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. God has come among you again powerfully. And then the words sometimes are mistranslated as repent. Uh, it really is not a good translation of the word that's there in Greek and behind it, the Hebrew word. The word in Greek is metanoite, and the, the Hebrew word behind it is shuva. Uh, this means to turn yourself around turn yourself inside out. It means to be transformed, to be con converted, really, uh, to be changed. Um, John is the prophet of change, as I think I put as the title of, of today's session. Uh, he makes it clear that God wants us to be alive, healthy, even if you will, which means that we are constantly growing and not stagnating. And if you consider that this is his essential message, this is his way of preparing the path for his cousin, uh, Jesus. Jesus will, in fact, have in his mouth almost the exact same words as his cousin, because in Mark's gospel, the very first words to come out of Jesus' mouth will be, the kingdom of heaven is very near to you. Turn around and uh, take the kingdom of heaven. In other words, start living as God wants you to live. The kingdom of heaven is not walls and fortresses and, a, and, and, and storehouses with gold and silver. It is not a battalion of military to protect an emperor. It is not um, a government with uh, strategic weapons that can take over and do violence to another country. No. Those ideas of kingdom are a are very worldly ones. Uh, the kingdom of God is simply to live as God wants us to be, made us to be, and wants us to live. For us today, this obviously means a great deal, given the world that we're living in. And I won't, I won't impose upon you all to uh, to try to spell out what that looks like and what that means. But certainly, we see a great deal of violence and hatred, of injustice uh, around us. We see it not only in our own country, we see it not only in racism re rearing its ugly head over and over again. We see it in anti-Semitism. We see it in hatred towards Muslims. We see it in suspicion and hatred towards anybody who comes from another country, any immigrant. Uh, but then we see it on a global level. Um, in our parish here, every Sunday, we pray for a different set of, of nations throughout the world that are experiencing violence, that are experiencing starvation, um, oppression, uh, either from someone else like Russia versus, versus Ukraine or from within because of civil war. Um, Yemen would be an example of that in Sudan, where the internal conflict is such that the only thing that results for most people is starvation and, uh, and misery and death. So John's message for us today is the same in many ways that it would have been in the first century of the common era. Uh, in his time, uh, himself and his parents, Jesus and everybody else, would have been living under Roman occupation. Uh, they had no right to, to make any decisions whatsoever in their own country. Uh, uh, they were living with a, a government that constantly harassed them, uh, that taxed them 
in a, in a, in a, in a terrible way. Uh, we know that because tax collectors were considered to be agents of the, of the evil one, of Satan, uh, stealing from the people and uh, putting that money at the use of the Roman occupiers. So if you take John's preaching back then and fast forward to our future, uh, in fact, it's quite relevant and quite powerful for us today. I'm going to stop there. Uh, there's a couple of images left, two of, of, of uh, John preaching. This is from uh, my great friend, the uh, French uh, artist, James Tissot, who mostly lived and worked in England, but uh, who, as I think I mentioned last time, uh, spent a couple of years after having a conversion back to his faith, back to faith, um, spent several years in Palestine. Uh, trying to absorb the landscape, the light, uh, how people dress, and uh, therefore prepared, uh, I think, over 300 paintings to illustrate major figures and major scenes, both in the Old Testament, Hebrew Bible, and in the New Testament. And this is one of several he did of John the Baptist. You can see this is out in the desert. John is in his element. Um, this is, you don't even see the Jordan River in this one. Uh, this is when, as the scriptures say, people went out to the desert to hear him preach, to ask his, um, his uh, blessing, uh, ask his advice. What's interesting here is you see the Roman soldiers. Uh, they too would have come out because this was always a possible threat. Even religious revivals were, at least uh, in principle, possible threats to Roman law and Roman rule. And uh, as I said before, John, in fact, addresses himself to the Roman soldiers. He doesn't take them as enemies. He takes them as part of the reality of his world. And he tells them, do what you're supposed to do. Don't abuse people. Uh, lastly, uh, you see a figure in white coming to hear uh, Jesus in Tissot's painting. That's his cousin, Jesus. And lastly, this is a wonderful, wonderful uh, Renaissance painting. This is Ghirlandaio, if you know his work at all. Um, you see here, John, this is obviously much more elegant, much more staged. You have uh, perhaps like a Venetian uh, uh, collection of court people here. Um, over here, all the way on the right, with a turban on his head, is a member of... Uh, uh, the, the Jewish clergy, uh, probably one of the teachers of the law. Uh, there, there are women. What's interesting here is that there are both men and women, and they are sort of segregated. The women all are over on the left. The men are all over on the right. And coming down the hill from what seems to be like a temple, once again, is the one for whom John is preparing the way, his cousin, Jesus. Uh, so this is not so much about the, the Jordan River. Uh, this is this is simply G, the, the preaching of John. Uh, interestingly enough, a bird, even though this is not the baptism, is hovering over uh, John. And John, of course, has a, a complete anachronism. He has a cross in his hand. Well, there has not been any crucifixion of his of his uh, cousin yet. So this is uh, one of those uh, examples of where sometimes an object is inserted and it doesn't belong there historically. The other thing is, is that this can't be anything but the outskirts of the desert because you see Jerusalem appearing right over the horizon there. And it, it looks like it's very close on by. So I'm going to stop talking. Uh, hopefully I've presented to you something uh, that's worthwhile and maybe you'll have some comments or questions. Yeah, do you want well, me to pull I'm, up the uh, section that you sent me? Uh, oh, yes, there's text. But let's ask some questions first, comments. Okay. Denise, I, I heard you starting. Yeah, uh, I like that uh, the second icon of John baptizing uh, Jesus with the, uh, um, it's like a triptych almost. Um, yeah. I like I liked his hairstyle. Did you? Yes, wild, and, huh? and, and and the and the wings 
kind of mimic yeah. his hairstyle. Okay. Oh yeah. So I thought, I can, I'll I, send you the. I'll send you those images. Yeah. Yeah. yeah okay. Um, I I I I hear what, you, what you're saying about uh, John and Jesus saying that the kingdom of God um, is coming and the kingdom of God is the kingdom of heaven is is very near to you. Yesterday, and th uh, this may be a little off topic from the icons themselves, but yesterday I listened to a webinar. Um, it was entitled Preaching in the Post-Christian Era. No, Preaching in the, in the what was it? Preaching? Oh, did I lose it? Preaching, preaching, preaching. Pre yeah, Preaching in the Post-Christian Era. And it was uh, hosted by Episcopal Parish Network. And um, there were very few of us uh, laity. Most of those who attended were all um, priests, deacons in, in mm -hmm. the Episcopal Church. Okay, yeah. but um, and what it was what it was addressing was essentially uh, how to how to get um, how 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 to attract young people. People who are uh, um, who are people who have left the church, people who are unchurched, and so forth and so on. And what one woman was saying, who was one of the uh, 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 speakers at this, uh, indicated that in all the work that she has done, um, she has she has come to learn that um, what the young people are looking for, they're looking for, I guess, a foundation. It, because uh, basically because they don't understand, they don't know the history of of the Bible. Okay, so um, you you mentioned here what the kingdom isn't, what the kingdom yeah. of he he heaven isn't. What do we tell a young person who's curious? What is the kingdom of heaven? Yeah. I I. I tend to see that as say when you say the kingdom of heaven is has come near to me it's what's inside of us yeah it's what's in, inside of me and what how i demonstrate i guess being close to the kingdom by how i live my life and how and in that how i treat other people exactly john oh. says at one point um you know, your prayers and what you believe are fine, but not enough because the real proof is what you do, what you do, how you live, how you treat other people. And the interesting thing about it is, is that, you know, when I was doing the research for my book and hunting down all the reasons that people who are religious nuns and religious duns give for not having anything to do with church, not going to church anymore if they used to, uh, had to do with extremism in the churches, uh, churches preaching nothing but political um, extremism and moral extremism and very exclusionary, very divisive uh, ideas. You know, the recently, I think I mentioned when I was there over the summer, right? Uh, Russell Moore, who used to be the president of the Southern Baptist, got a visit from one of his uh, seminary classmates who said, you know what's happened in my congregation? I'm preaching one Sunday on the Sermon on the Mount, the Beatitudes, and I have angry people waiting for me at the door saying, where did you get all that woke stuff about the poor, uh, about the, the, the downtrodden? Uh, uh, about the ones who are blessed in the kingdom, you know? He said, I got news for you. I didn't make that stuff up. Those were the very words of Christ from the Gospels. And their response was, well, then we ought to stop reading them and we ought to stop talking about them because that's not who we are. We're, we're better than that. Uh, we're, we're stronger Christians than that. That's that's exactly what the liberals are all about. They're always going on about loving your neighbor, about feeding your neighbor, about sheltering your neighbor, about giving refuge to uh, refugees. Uh, that's woke. That's that's destroying our country. You know, I could keep going on and on with this, 
But uh -huh. Moore wrote about this because he's first and foremost the Southern Baptist. You can't get any more traditional. You can't get any more conservatively Christian than that. And yet, you know, even he said this. This shows you how far and how extreme things have come uh, these days in America. That even the words of Christ Himself uh, are not good enough. They're not. They're not somehow American enough, or strong enough, or bold enough, or what have you. Um, I would. I would say you're on the mark when you say that. Uh, the only way to talk to anybody today is uh, put the religious stuff to the side and say, okay, what would it look like, the kingdom of God? It would look like people being treated fairly. It would look like people sharing. It would look like people not being discriminated against. And you can go on and on and on with that. It would be, in many cases, exactly the opposite of what is happening today. You know, Michael, we've yep. had this discussion, um, yep. and, and you, you know the statistics better than I do, but, but we've had this discussion, but the, the churches that are getting increasing attendance are not necessarily the ones that are um, espousing inclusiveness. They're, they're the true. ones that are, they're the That's ones true. that are espousing extreme positions mm -hmm. and basically using their interpretation of the bible to um shame mm -hmm. and um condemn mm -hmm. others and mm -hmm. now it, and you also know the statistics that it tends not to be a long lasting uh yeah. attendance but but it draws people in mm -hmm. and uh and so it's I mean, it's kind of sad, and um, yeah, it, it, we we've talked a number of times, you and I have, and for Denise's benefit, um, about how translations of the Bible from whatever original language a particular book was written in, ultimately through a couple different translations, uh, and then into English, tend to have tend to be differing depending upon what the political state was at the time yeah. and yeah. it and it and it keeps coming up that we say well the original word for this doesn't really mean what we yeah. the word that we have here and mm -hmm. today the example is kingdom and i'm wondering was the original word in the original language for kingdom of god different than the word for a um secular kingdom no it's exactly the same word the word in greek is basileum and that comes from basileos the, the the emperor is the basileos like basil you know it, it would look very close mm -hmm. to the the word basil in english but obviously that means a plant although the name of that plant is because it was considered to be uh what you use to make the laurel for the emperor's you know when he got uh, installed crowned they didn't use a gold crown they use a crown of basil leaves and basil as we know has a beautiful aroma some people don't like it but it's it's you know it's there but that yeah no the the word was exactly the same word as you would have used for you know the the state of that time for the empire of that time in 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 latin which was not the the language of the street greek was but let's say for the documents and so forth, the, the Greek word was imperium because the emperor is the imperator, right? So uh, yeah, I, what's interesting is that these are secular terms. Uh, and it's interesting that in the Christian New Testament, the language tends to not be uh, derived primarily from the religious legacy of the past. I mean, obviously, the Hebrew Bible is the scriptures for Jesus and for his disciples. Even, even when you hear Paul talking about the scriptures, he's not talking about his letters. He's not talking about the gospels because they haven't even been written down yet. He's talking about the Hebrew Bible, which can, you know, consists of the first five books. That's the Torah. That's the most important part. 
But then the second most important part is the writings of all the prophets, the major prophets, the minor prophets. And then the third most important is the prayer book or the hymn, hymnal, which is the book of Psalms. And then the other ones, the, the, the so-called wisdom literature and the historical books and such. Um, I, I think it's telling that, that oftentimes when Jesus decides to tell a story, all summer long I was talking about, and so were other supply priests, about these parables. Some of them extremely difficult because the, Matthew, the parables in Matthew's Gospels are not easy ones. There are some easy ones, but not in Matthew's Gospel. Well, same thing. Almost none of them take place in a temple or in a synagogue with rabbis or with scribes or Levites, priests, or anything like that. They, they have to do with a, a, a rich guy, you know, who gives two of his slaves who are sort of upper level administrators these huge pieces of precious metal, which are symbolic of unbelievable amounts of money, you know, 30 or more years of salary. These are the talents, right? There, there's not, it's, that has nothing to do with juggling or being able to, you know, ride a bike or something like that. It has to do with an enormous amount of money. And that's a difficult parable. I, I won't go into it now, but, you know, uh, it, it's not an easy one to come to an understanding of because it ends with a guy who's a loser who may be in the end actually the only one who stood up to his really uh, ruthless, unscrupulous, uh, master who probably destroyed thousands of lives to acquire his uh, enormous wealth and keep it. Um, I think when people today say uh, all of your talk, you church people, is meaningless and empty to me, I think that's a challenge to us. I think we we once again, as John would tell us, we have to to ponder and then change the way that we are communicating. And all of us, I mean, I think I can say, since both of you are good friends of mine, both of us know how the institutional church operates and how oftentimes it chooses, even today, when congregations are shrinking, uh, to be rigid about its rules and to have a certain style of communication uh, that almost nobody understands. <clears throat> And that most clergy and people don't particularly like. So we're well, Michael, all... I mean, I mean, <laughs> Michael, you you know I am I am involved at the diocesan level. <laughs> I only say that primarily for Denise's benefit because she does, she's not aware of that. But um, I was recently at a diocesan level meeting where there was discussion about how to effectively communicate things and, and uh, preach. And they talked about, well, you know, we need to tell stories and we need to do this because it's more mm -hmm. effective. And after five minutes of hearing that we should tell stories, the one thing that struck me is no one said the word parable. Like, yeah. what did you think of parable? <laughs> you, would, you would think that at a gathering like that, they would. Well, I mean, I think I've told the story to both of you. I won't mention names. But a uh, retired bishop once said to me, when, when we were having a very open conversation with one another, I said to him, And I, and I, and I, I won't reveal the name, but I know who you're talking about. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I said to him, because he was, I said, you can ask me anything you want. My, my life is an open book, ask away. And when I got to, it was my turn to ask him, I said, so tell me, if you could go back to when you were a bishop, uh, knowing what you know now, after having spent years doing that and retiring and doing something else would you do anything differently or was there anything that that stuck out that was not really uh good first thing he said was he said several but i will share with you the first thing that he said and it was i made the mistake of listening to my staff rather than listening to the pastors and the people of the parishes uh, that I was supposed to be caring for. Um, the staff often told me, don't listen to those people. They need to hear what direction we're going in from you and uh, 
from us at the at the leadership of the diocese. Well, that doesn't sound much like service, does it? It sounds like a very corporate, you know, when my wife was working in the corporate world, Denise worked in the corporate world, Patrick is a retired lawyer. This is this is the way the corporations behave, right? There's a certain way of dressing where there used to be. There's a certain way of speaking, right? And uh, if you deviate from that, you 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 become uh, an outlier, right? Yep. <laughs> yep. So I think, you know, coming back to the churches that supposedly are growing, there just was an article I came across yesterday that was based on the work of a, a Baptist pastor and sociologist of religion whom I've uh, uh, had conversations with online named Ryan Berge. He teaches um, at Eastern Illinois University, I think. Um, he's the one who's been doing a lot of statistical, you know, more quantitative work on uh, uh, people not going to church, people leaving congregations and, and the like. And one of the things that he was asked in an in a interview on a blog was, why are these so-called uh, non-denominational churches? They're not all mega churches. Not a, they're not all big. Why are they growing? And he said, "Well, you know, I can tell you why they're growing, but uh, please don't misunderstand me to be approving of it." And what I what I heard that I had not heard before is uh, that they purposely avoid anything that's controversial, anything that uh, would, you know, force you to say where you stand politically. Uh, they, for example, because they have so many younger families with children, they tend to make a big deal about family life, about activities for kids, uh, about after school tutoring programs, wonderful kind of stuff. But interestingly enough, he said, it all tends to be introverted. It tends to all be for us, just for us in this wonderful congregation. And they they probably wouldn't even use the word congregation because that's an old fashioned religious word. They would say in our family here at uh, the Church of Joy, let's say, because oftentimes they name themselves in a way that has no connection with a saint or even with, with Jesus. By the way, the big thing about them is that they consider any name like Episcopal, Catholic, Presbyterian, Methodist, Ortho Eastern Orthodox to be a turnoff because people have bad memories of those denominations and they're of the past. It's the same kind of thing when you come into their church buildings, like my uh, my son, well, I consider her my daughter-in-law, even though they're not married. But uh, she said to me one time, I went into the Red Rock Church here in Arveda, and I thought I was in a bank. Uh, uh, you know, they I, they showed me where they assemble, but there wasn't a cross, there wasn't a stained glass window, there was no altar, there were these huge screens, and then all of these setups for their praise band. And I said, well, Kristen, it's because they're built uh, on a model that goes all the way back over 30 years to an experiment outside of Chicago, Willow Creek Church. Willow Creek Church, interesting. I mean, you can't get any more vague than <laughs> Willow Creek, which is a name of the- Wasn't there, wasn't there a huge scandal about Willow it, Creek yeah, Church? Yeah, enormous scandals. The place is pretty much uh, a shadow of what it used to be. Well, anyway, let me just finish the thought. Uh, the 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 thing that Bergie said is that, uh, and I gave and I, I shared this with Kristen, is uh, they don't want to look like church. They don't want to sound like church. They don't want to in any way evoke anything that you would remember if you walked into St. Barnabas or into St. James or any of the churches that the three of us have known in our lifetimes that we would identify and that we would feel at home in, you know? Um, so, I, you know, Ber Berge, I think uh, he's, the, he's the specialist in this. And I think he's quite right that not only in some cases do they push a very, very uh, particular kind of attitude toward politics, they also do a lot of avoidance. They also do a lot of, um, you know, 
getting you getting you uh, like politicians do, getting you off the subject, you know, d- distracting you in a certain sense and saying, well, isn't it more important to think about our children? Isn't it more important to think about our health? Isn't it more important to think about, uh, you know, the things that make for a happy, good life? But interestingly enough, not for anybody else, just for us. And Bergie was you know, the one who pointed that out. That. I, I'm not sure I agree that they avoid controversy. I think they court controversy. Well, some of them um, do. Some of them do. And, but but, and, but there are some they court that really... in the sense of, of not, not promoting what they're for, but <clears throat> promoting a common enemy. Well, you know, they're not like 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 the old fashioned church bodies that we call denominations. They're not all of one sort. They have distinct differences right you you know when you're an episcopal church you know when you're in a methodist church but in the world of methodism today as my friend right next door the methodist pastor keeps reminding me he said methodist means almost anything you want it to mean nowadays right there are methodist churches that are very traditional and there are methodist churches you walk into and it's like walking into a non-denominational church you, you know there's nothing to remind you that this is a church um other than but, but, yeah, other than other than the screens we, and so if on. we go back 500 if we go back 500 years yeah that was that was one of the big things that the protestants were against was vestments and iconic yeah I, yeah images and, vestments, and, yep. and, the, and the images and they, they were trying to remove all of that too and and after about 100 years or so they said well let's start slowly bringing some of this stuff back yeah, and and now a lot of the things that we as Episcopalians love in our traditions, um, if you if you showed them to Thomas Cranmer, he would be appalled. Oh yeah, <clears throat> yeah. Or even 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 as late as the 1930s and 40s, these would have been called papists. They would have been, you know, that's too Catholic, right? Uh, we 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 have to be distinctly Protestant. Although it's interesting. Other Episcopalians would say, oh, no, 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 we're Anglicans. We're, we're not Protestants. Protestants are all of those people over there, the, the Methodists and the Lutherans and the Presbyterians and Reformed and, and so and, on. And, yeah. and even the names of some of the denominations have more to do with the method of church governance than they yep. do with the belief. Presbyterian, right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Episcopal. Right. Episcopal, um, yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, again, that that was used to distinguish yourself from the churches that don't have bishops, right? In England, it was just the Church of England. It still is. But in Scotland, where the official state church was an anti-bishop church, a Presbyterian church, and it was called simply the Church of Scotland, uh, interestingly enough, when it got in, when it got exported to America, it became the Presbyterian the Church. Presbyterian. And the Presbyterian label and the Episcopal label are were consciously, deliberately chosen to counter each other, right? When it comes to the Methodists, John Wesley, if you asked him what a Methodist was, he wouldn't know what you were talking about. Um, uh, that, that was actually an epithet. That was, uh, you know, a way of putting down the first followers of that reform movement. As far as so, as far as was Wesley Quaker. was concerned, they were simply part of the Church of England that had been kind of dismissed and uh, distanced. Uh, and as far as he was concerned, there was only one prayer book to use in the services, and that was the Book of Common Prayer. Right? There's a lot of other things that are interesting about the Reformation, but maybe maybe that's for another time. <laughs> Of course, whenever we do a John the Baptist at this time of the year, I'm re- I remember. Um, yeah, I guess it was two years ago when the bishop came out for her visitation. Yeah, and gave a gave a sermon about how she was decorating the Christmas tree. But gosh, you get all these wonderful secular things, but nobody does a John the Baptist uh, ornament. Right, and uh, we. And uh, while while I was sitting in the back of the church, I found one online, and we had it delivered to her by 
my Amazon two days. <laughs> you see, you see how we deal with our bishop, Denise. <laughs> she got in the mail. Uh, uh, a, a like John you the can't Baptist. find a John the Baptist tournament here. We get you one. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're almost uh, out of time. Next week, uh, just to, to, for a preview, uh, speaking of someone who is oftentimes, you know, uh, an object of great discussion and disagreement, uh, but yet there she is. She's uh, she's so essential in the scriptures that there wouldn't be a Jesus without her. That's Jesus' mother, Mary, who we mostly call St. Mary the Virgin or the Blessed Virgin Mary. Anyway, uh, that will be the focus next week. Well, and you, you know, you probably can figure out that one of the things we'll look at is her wonderful song, the Magnificat. Uh, in fact, this week, uh, it is one of the possible, uh, it's a possible alternative to the psalm. And I ask that since I'm preaching this week out here, uh, that we chant or sing uh, it. And in fact, as it turns out, whoever prepared the hymns for this week has also picked out a hymn version of the Magnificat. So we'll actually uh, get to sing it two times. I don't know what Joanne has picked out there, but. Uh, I know. Well, what is the hymn version? Uh, the hymn version is my soul tells out the, the greatness of the Lord. Uh, you'd have to look it up in the hymn, though. Okay. I don't have the number right here, but but okay. but it's yeah. There's actually a couple of them in there. There's a couple of hymn versions of Magnificat. Yeah. Because I'm preaching on her uh, a week from Sunday. Yeah, yeah. Usually that's the yeah. That's yeah. So use that. Use and I was that. wondering, and I was wondering about the music, but I haven't, but I haven't seen Joanne to get that from her yet. So yeah, yeah. Okay. Well, listen, thank you all for coming, and I'm going to conclude with the, the, the prayer that is uh, used uh, both for the birth of St. John the Baptist and also for uh, his death, uh, his heavenly birthday. Let us pray. Almighty God, by whose providence <clears throat> your servant, John the Baptizer, was wonderfully born and sent to prepare the way of your son, our Savior, by pe preaching repentance. Make us so to follow his teaching and holy life that we may truly repent according to his preaching and following his example, constantly speak the truth, boldly rebuke injustice, and patiently suffer for the truth's sake. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Amen. 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 Well, thank you, and I wish you a continued good Advent, and 